Today's session continues with the first in the same format as yesterday. This morning, the first session will be moderated by the Global Foundation for the Performing Arts and will focus on international music competitions, which are another important form of professional development and a career growth path for young artists and a space for intergenerational knowledge sharing. After this session, we will move to the second half of the annual meeting of the Global Music Education League and uh, the president, Professor Li Guang Wang. Meetings, advocacy, promotion, and maintaining international directories of events are very important to the Global Foundation of the Performing Arts. We link together different parts of our sector, and I'm delighted that we are, that we are able to have, for instance, in this first session, the directors of music conservatoires and the directors of music competitions listening to one another here this morning. We'll be joined shortly by, I will invite the, uh, the director of the UNESCO liaison office in New York in, in a moment to say a few words. Uh, uh, but um, before then, I would just like to announce that our first session will begin and it is entitled International Music Competitions, Artist Discovery and Growth. At this point, uh, I will just check if, uh, where are we? Here we are. If it is all right, uh, I would like to, uh, j'invite Madame Marie-Paul Rudil to say uh, a word of welcome. Uh, merci bien. Um, uh, Marie-Paul Rudil is the director of the UNESCO Liaison Office in New York and the UNESCO representative to the United Nations since 2015. The GFPA, my organization, has been working with UNESCO this year on its in, in innovative Resiliart program, which is highlighting the work of organizations and the plight of the cultural sector in the, in the, in the response to the COVID-19 situation. Um, so it is a pleasure to invite uh, Madame Rudil to say some words. And maintenant, je vous donne la parole. Merci. Thank you very much, Ben, and thank you. Congratulations for your French pronunciation. It's uh, perfect. Thank you for inviting me, and uh, it is a pleasure to, in these difficult and uncertain times, to meet with all of you and with uh, your prestigious uh, uh, partners to, to share some thoughts on global music education. Uh, I was trying to listen yesterday, your first part of the meetings, and uh, as you said, uh, this is a key moment for rethinking music education. Its role to advancing sustainable development and human potential further, especially given the unprecedented blow that the pandemic has struck to the cultural and educational fields. As you know, you mentioned that UNESCO is the only United Nations agency with core mandate areas in culture heritage, arts, creativity, and education. At UNESCO, we are convinced that music and performing arts education in particular may enable people to lead more fulfilling lives and be equipped with the skills to make positive changes. The link between performing arts and education contributes to the achievement of the agenda, what we are calling here the roadmap of the United Nations, you mentioned it, the agenda 2030, and in particular, the goal for quality education, as music education is an important aspect of providing children with a well-rounded education. Uh, may, may allow me to make a kind of a brief historic uh, 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 reference we have a long-standing commitment to recognizing the importance of the arts in formation and maturation of human development, as well in strengthening synergies between culture, including performing arts and education. Linking education and culture is not new. From uh, 1949, you know, four years after yesterday, it was our birthday, 75th anniversary of the creation of UNESCO. And in 1949, we held already an education expert meeting that was followed in 1954 by the creation of the International Association for Art Education. We, uh, we have developed international frameworks to raise awareness of the vital roles of arts education. And I would just mention two major conferences for 
according to me, which are really a milestone in the story of arts education. In 2006 and 2010, a major, major outcome is the Seoul Agenda, Goals for the Development of Arts Education. It is a frame for reference for an inter international inquiry into arts education, calling for the active engagement and ongoing commitment of all stakeholders. And uh, I will also mention the fact that in 2011, UNESCO proclaims the fourth week of May every year. We are celebrating International Arts Education Week. And I hope that after this meeting, you are going to be partners and celebrate this uh, uh, each year in May, the International Arts Education Week to draw attention to the critical value of arts education. So uh, in the Last year, we organized, on the occasion of the General Conference, we organized a forum of Minister of Culture. And uh, in this occasion, we decided to strengthen the multi-sectoral mandate of UNESCO and uh, to strengthen our efforts in the field of culture and education. And to this end, we, we carry out regional studies. And uh, I would like to, to call your attention to the fact that, of course, there is a big discrepancy in the approach of uh, art education, music education in the world. Uh, for, ex for instance, in Central and Eastern Europe, the research showed a strong integration of arts education policies within school curricula, with a focus on skill development and the trans transmission of tradition rather than creativity and innovation. In Africa, very few educational or cultural policies prioritize culture and arts education. Turning to the Arab states, tertiary education in culture related disciplines remain underdeveloped, and most countries lack adequate infrastructures to, for arts education, such as academies of music, dance, theater, and visual arts. So uh, you could see that uh, the strategy and uh, the resource made available for art education uh, vary substantially according to region and culture. I think it is quite important for your panel to understand and to measure the, the discrepancy in the world, all over the world. This year, as it has been underscored, the cultural and educational sectors were once of the first to suffer, and they are still suffering a lot. Among the bad news, there are some positive signals, and I would like to underscore the fact that we at UNESCO we observed a new renewed interest among member states in UNESCO multidisciplinary mandate, notably as uh, concerned culture and education. So, as you mentioned, Ben, we UNESCO, since this spring, UNESCO has engaged in a renewed reflection and been devising plan of actions in order to highlight the interrelated impact of culture to enhance quality education and learning outcomes. At the same time, the need for the culture sector more broadly integrating a more systematic approach, systemic approach to edu educational methodologies. Today, during the global COVID-19 pandemic, the link between culture and education has been amplified for social and emotional support, individual and collective development, despite the lockdown in some countries, thereby nurturing resilience and contributing to building back better. Numerous digital initiatives providing quality cultural contents have been launched or reinforced across many member states to ensure an interrupted access to culture by the public and to serve as a vital means to guarantee an enriched education in the out-of-school settings, as well as for the resilience of, of people. The pandemic has also directly impacted premature disappearance of artists, cultural entrepreneurs and other cultural actors deprived of an audience, venues, and a salary. We are here in New York. We know how much cultural sector has been affected by the closure of theaters, of the operas, of the uh, music hall. The artists are particularly affected across the world. They are vulnerable as they are often self-employed or work in small or medium enterprises. The music, individual, visual arts, performing arts, and publishing industries have also suffered huge losses in royalties of up to 3.5 billion, nearly 40% in the last period. The COVID-19 pandemic has prompted an unprecedented acceleration in access to culture online, often with very little preparation. Nevertheless, starkly exposed the digital divide on access to culture and cultural contents. For many countries worldwide, digital penetration is around 35% 
meaning two in three people do not have access to online content. So this has to be really underlined. Uh, you know, uh, we know that uh, access to uh, internet at home is limited to 2%. So uh, how could we go ahead with such a discrepancy and could we go ahead including for virtual music education? So to ensure some, uh, to ensure continued access to culture during the pandemic, countless cultural edu institutions and individual artists have turned to digital activities, from virtual music mu uh, visits to museums to e-books. Why these initiatives in the short term of access to culture, often for free? participants in the UNESCO Resilience, and you mentioned the 200 um, meetings we, we organized, the Resilience debates, highlighted that this also sends the wrong message. Culture content is not free. Artists and creative professionals must be fairly remunerated for their work, and this has to be really underlined. UNESCO closely monitors the impact and responses of culture under the COVID-19 for collection and exchange of data, good practices, and mechanism with the objective of assessing and mitigating the impact of COVID-19 on culture sector in the short, medium, and long term. We will continue our close collaboration with governments and performing arts stakeholders in support of advancement of the performing arts. Rarely is the power of culture fully harnessed and seen as a resource to enrich learning, so we know that it plays a critical role in overcoming the last barrier for all. Uh, I important to raise and to support our efforts to strengthen the awareness at the worldwide level. We think that, you know, too often the two sectors, culture and education, are uh, apprehended separately. And you are making, you are the ones who are making the links, you are the actors of the global approach, of the multidisciplinary approach. And you know, we have to change uh, the behavior of a lot of decision makers. When speaking of culture, more and more, we are speaking mainly of the challenge with the digital economy. More and more, we are addressing the question of uh, arts education, music education, too much, too often. We are a lot of uh, our partners have the temptation to consider that uh, arts education has to be marginalized because it is not a priority for uh, bringing quality, for promoting quality education. So our challenge today is a wonderful opportunity with the COVID-19 crisis to try to push, and uh, I am confident that uh, thanks to your efforts today and, the day and yesterday, I think that you are supporting this uh, awareness we need because, you know, a lot of people coming here in New York uh, for the meetings uh, when they are in person, and I hope that it will come back soon, they are too much often of the preparation of all this wonderful community, which is making the difference to build our mutual comprehension and our dialogue and our development not only in New York, but all over the world. And I think your mission is really rightly in the heart of the UN. And I thank you very much for your contribution to the worldwide effort. And I hope and you, be, you could count on me to be one of the first to advocate at the United Nations to reinforce and strengthen the promotion of culture as a tool for development. Thank you very much. Merci, Madame Houdil. Thank you very much for these words that align with our mission and the work that we are doing today. I wish to say a very quick uh, repeat thank you to Ambassador Suazo from, the, from UNITAR and his team for making this platform available for us today. And uh, now I would like very much to move forward to our first session and um, welcome the directors of international music competitions who are joining us. Uh, we have a short time. So what I would like to do is uh, announce by name the competitions that are joining us in this section. 
And then I will ask some questions to specific competitions to get the conversation started. Today, we are joined by, from Bamburg, the Mahler competition. And perhaps, uh, Marcus, you could, it, perhaps if each competition could raise their hand, we will know which is the uh, director at the time. Thank you. Committed to uh, conducting. Next, we have from Bergen, Norway, the Edvard Grieg International Piano Competition. Which is Monica, yes, thank you. We're joined by Monsieur Nicolas Dernancourt from the Queen Elizabeth Competition in Brussels. Good morning. We also are joined uh, from Cardiff in Wales the, with the B, from the BBC Cardiff Singer of the World Competition with David Jackson. From Graz in Austria, the Franz Schubert and Modern Music International Chamber Music Competition. From Helsinki, the International Piano Competition My Lind and the Sibelius Academy. From Hong Kong, welcome to the Hong Kong International Piano Competition, Annabella and Andrew, thank you. From Leeds, the Leeds International Piano Competition. From Montreal in Canada, the Canadian International Organ Competition. Good morning, Thomas. From Oslo, the Queen Sonia International Music Competition for Voice. From Sydney, the Sydney International Piano Competition. Thank you, Piers. From Trondheim, the Trondheim International Chamber Music Competition and Academy. Welcome, Kristen. And from Vilnius, the Lithuanian International Music Competitions that actually exist in a variety of disciplines uh, operating at the moment. So we have a short time, how to maximize this time and this great opportunity. But I really see this as the first step in, in a number of these types of forums where we have competitions speaking directly with conservatory directors. And we will be doing more such uh, dialogue sessions in the coming months. I think we'll start uh, with a competition that went ahead this year, despite all uh, uh, recommendations or warnings not to. And I would like to pass the floor to uh, Marcus Rudolf Axt from the Mahler competition in Bangburg. Bamberg, if you'd be able to say a few words about your experience in, in going ahead with a competition in the middle of the pandemic. Thank you very much, Benjamin. Thank you and good morning to all of you. I'm happy to be here to be invited to share our experience with the Mahler competition. We uh, really went forward with the competition this year in end of June, beginning of July. In, and I think we were the, the only competition at that time that uh, was running. And it started with um, studies that we did in Bamberg already uh, at the beginning of May regarding the airflow spread from wind instruments. So the first, um, first idea was the first problem was how can we put an orchestra on stage in the size for a Mahler competition. And a Mahler competition means you need uh, at least 65, 70 musicians on stage to perform the Mahler symphonies. So um, we started these airflow studies, which uh, led to the uh, discovery that uh, wind instruments, wind and brass instruments were not so heavily spreading aerosols than uh, previously um, uh, expected especially from politicians. And we, we were able to establish a model of a distancing on stage of 1.5 meters from each musician and two meters in the direction of uh, ventilation in brass and wind instruments. In addition to this, we uh, enlarged the stage in our concert hall in order to accommodate the, the whole orchestra. So this was the part on stage and the other part was to get the participants into Bamberg, into Bavaria, Germany uh, at this point of the year, which was a little bit tricky because regulations changed every uh, two or three weeks. Some of them really came a lot earlier than expected. They, they came and went into a quarantine in Bamberg for 14 days just to be here and to be safe to participate in that competition. And you have to know that we had about 
500 applications for this and uh, 16 candidates were chosen to come to Bamberg for the finals. In the end, we made it for um, 12 candidates really to arrive into the competition, but there was one person from Russia, two from Korea. Uh, we didn't get in the Americans because this was too complicated in the end. They weren't allowed uh, entrance into Germany. But more or less, it was an international panel of candidates and it was an international panel of jury members. We had part of the jury uh, online uh, joining us via Zoom. So we had a jury room with nine jury members in Bamberg and three others uh, attending um, uh, online to the sessions. And also we put the whole competition online in a free live stream for everybody and also to the jury members watching this. And uh, this was really organized very short term, but it, it, it worked somehow. The, the good outcome of this was that we had this competition, we, we gave the chance to a very, very good winner, uh, um, uh, Finnegan Downey Deer from England to get the first prize in the competition. He is now really on a very good path to, a, to an international career. And we also gave prizes to a second winner and three third prize winners in order to share as much prize money during these times to young people as we could afford. And also we had, uh, I think about 20,000 viewers of the competition online worldwide, which we would never have had when it was, would only have been uh, taking place in Bamberg and uh, probably just the final concert would have been uh, streamed live online. So I just can say it was a very exciting experience also because the well, the, the, the feeling, the atmosphere of being linked together in a, in a sort of um, um, beautiful and wonderful island, uh, <laughs> not being allowed to get out or, 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 or to move uh, very far away was, was really special. We, uh, all the, the contestants, they really made friends with each other. And um, we also, um, created a new um, a program to support the finalists in the future, which was initiated by Barbara Hennigan. She was also part of our jury. And this is called Momentum Now. And it's an idea to established artists, singers, conductors, instrumentalists, to include young prospective uh, artists into their concerts and give them a little bit of performance challenge into real proper concerts for a little fee, which they would um, uh, provide for this in order to, well, to, to, to keep the chances of young people that are now coping with lots of cancellations. And you know, when a young artist is canceled now, uh, he or she wouldn't get the return date next year, but maybe in five or six years time from now, because uh, everybody is, is, is now trying to get the, the, the um, big names back as soon as possible, also for commercial reasons. So I think that's a great initiative and more or less it started with the idea of participating in that Mahler competition in Bamberg. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marcus. Uh, I'd like to pass to a competition that uh, was planning to go ahead, but like a number last year or earlier this year has chosen to postpone uh, its edition through until 2021. I'd like to pass uh, to um, Nicola Denencourt from Brussels and talk about uh, your experience and uh, predictions perhaps for Maintaining, maintaining what would normally be an annual competition into a spread over two years with your piano edition in 21. Uh, okay, I'm on, I'm on. Excellent. Hello everybody. Uh, Hello. Thanks Benjamin for, for invitation for, for this meeting. Uh, well, for us maybe to react to what have been said, well, we have a very long competition. It's one month long. We have a competition every year and we should have uh, welcomed 
74 candidates in Brussels, uh, which uh, in March and April seemed very difficult. It was planned in May and there was really no option for us uh, to have it, uh, even with, uh, with adaptations in, in, any, uh, in any way. So that's why we decided to postpone it by one year. Another problem we, we have is that we have indeed a competition every year. Um, and so we don't have much flexibility in that sense. We have to be, uh, because every month of May is totally devoted to one competition and we have all the preparation uh, before that. Here in this case, we had already done the pre-selection process because we had received uh, between 330 and 350 uh, applications for this piano competition. And so what we decided to do is keep the 74 pianists selected and just uh, postpone it uh, for one year and do not reorganize a pre-selection or do anything like that. So we just moved by one year uh, the, the, um, the public rounds, in fact, because the, 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 the pre-selection that were based on, on videos had already been done. Now, uh, well, we hope it will be uh, possible to hold it in May 21, because it's not that obvious that everything will be back to normal by then. Um, and, uh, and that's why we are now work currently working on very different scenarios, um, depending, of course, on what are the, the measures that are possible here in Brussels in order to organize uh, public events and also the traveling uh, possibilities for the candidates and the jury members. Uh, I think like you had in Bamberg, we expect not having all the candidates coming and we expect some difficulties for some countries to travel, but we still hope to have at least uh, a certain number of candidates able to travel to Brussels. I think uh, we, hope to have all the people uh, living in Europe being able to travel by then. Uh, let's, let's be optimistic. And the same with the jury members. We are also thinking, well, like you did in Bamberg, about the possibilities to have some, uh, maybe some jury members not coming uh, on the place. But we still want uh, to have uh, a real meeting. I think it's, it's very important to keep of the link between the people participating in competitions and the jury members. I think a competition is not a place where you select a winner. It's a meeting place for artists and it's very important, I think, in all, in all um, sense for artists in their educational process and in, in their uh, study process and meeting the jury members and meeting all these professionals, meeting the audience is very important. So if we cannot have an audience, at least I think it's very important that we can create a link between those musicians um, and uh, their, their elders, their, their, the, the teachers or the, the, the great musicians in, in, in the jury. So um, it's difficult to say more for now because uh, we are still thinking and, and evaluating, I would say every week we are re-evaluating what is possible and um, being in touch with all of you <laughs> and, uh, and, and learning from the experiences of, of colleagues uh, to see how we can uh, keep on doing what we have to do, which is support young artists in their development. Merci, Nicolas. Uh, we, we spent yesterday talking about professional development opportunities, and I could not agree more that competitions are such an opportunity. Uh, I want to touch on a slightly different angle um, and move to Trondheim and the chamber music competition in Trondheim. Kristen, you had a different situation last year. You had an academy, you were, oh, sorry. Yes, it was last year. No, it was this year. You were about to present an academy an international academy, and you made the decision to, of course, uh, international musicians could not come, and you made the switch to, to make it a national event. How did that shift? I'm very interested in, perhaps, was that a positive, was that an interesting learning opportunity? Is it something you might continue in the future? Well, for, for us, uh, we were in a situation where we could have uh, musicians come on a worker's visa, 
and uh, that's why we could have the teachers and the instructors come because they they are getting paid but the participants could not come because they were considered students. So uh, that's why we decided as a plan B, this was quite early actually, this was our primary plan B. And we also pushed to get Norwegian applicants. And I think uh, because we have a lot of public support, so for us to go through with the arrangements and also to have this international contact to the, towards the Norwegian young quartets. It was really beneficial for, for all. And, and we were very happy with how everything worked out. And I have to say, it was quite touching to see uh, the audience meet the musicians, both the young ones and the instructors in concert at the festival here, because uh, I think they missed each other. So we need, we need to make arrangement happen and we need to go through. So uh, for me, I think uh, uh, we have to do what we can do. And uh, most of us are used to <laughs> working creatively to make arrangements uh, work, whatever happens. So uh, I think a lot of us have been working like that this past year. So uh, uh, we are going for an international competition in 21. And yes. of course we, do not know what's going to happen, but uh, we our motto is to stay realistic but optimistic. So <laughs> we plan to go through. Stay flexible, I would recommend. Uh, yeah. Another competition that's well close to where I'm from, uh, peers, the Sydney International Piano Competition. You've had to be uh, adaptable as well. Uh, your competition has already been moved. Uh, by a year and uh, you're watching travel restrictions and travel requirements uh, intensely. What are your thoughts of an online competition or not? Um, you need to... Is that better? Right. Perfect. Good. Hello everybody and thank you Ben for this occasion. Um, Sydney, of course, is in a, in a tricky position because we're so far from everywhere. I, I think Scandinavia and Belgium are slightly different in that you have access to other European countries. But for us to work, Australia, first of all, would have to allow um, state borders to be open. And it shows how fragile that is at the moment. Two days ago or three days ago, South Australia opened its borders, had three cases of COVID, immediately in quarantined people who spread it to 17. Now they've shot the border there again. And so, you know, to have the borders for uh, 17 nationalities for all the competitors and the jury open and social distancing in concert halls, not allowing us the box office of which we're dependent for our budget um, means that I've had to rejig the entire competition and it's not public yet. So I can't talk about details, but we're going to go online next year and make it a recital prize. The, um, the stakeholders involved have almost entirely been wonderfully supportive. Uh, there'll still be major prizes. I'm absolutely delighted that the record company I had lined up for the winner has agreed to give that prize because last time's winner, Andre Gugnan, found that he got more out of having that recording prize than anything because Hyperion Records offered only one disc, but they liked him so much and he won the instrumental disc of the year last year for the BBC Music Magazine through his uh, Sydney Hyperion recording um, that they've offered him many more. He's already recorded four discs so that, and through that, IMG took him on uh, as an agency. That's been a big success. So that was a, a, a real <laughs> pleasure for me to know that uh, they're going to support us as well. And I'm hoping, you know, it's very difficult in Australia to get any money from government at all for competitions. It's a, it's a bad word. And they don't realize somehow that, you know, the Sydney International has a 40 year history and it is very representative of Australia internationally, culturally. But um, I'm hoping to maybe run a festival, a piano festival just with Australians at the same time to try and attract live audience to Sydney. That's in the balance. We're just gonna wait and see what will happen. And I take on Nicolas, um, you know, observation that it's so important for the candidates to have the access to the jury 
and to their their colleagues. And yes, that, that's a terrible thing to miss out on. But I just feel we were supposed to be in 2020. It's it's more or less impossible for us to be in 2021. To move to 22 worries me because that's two years out. Some of the contestants would be well over the age limit. It's not that that worries me so much as the fact that that year is going to be very congested. So many competitions have moved to 22 already, has its own competitions. 21 competitions may well have to move to 22 as well. So I thought perhaps best to completely change the remit and go for an online event and, and see what we can do with it. I think it's very wise. Uh, you're juggling multiple scenarios uh, constantly and seeing which ones come through. And calendar situations are a real issue for competitions uh, to get visibility and access and focus from some of the key decision makers uh, that can assist young artists. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, I'm looking at the um, screen. My screen is flickering a little, but I think we're fine now. Yes, I can see everyone. Um, uh, Brita in Graz, um, you've, you've, you've opened your competition for applications. Are you uh, seeing an increased uh, attraction for competitions? Are you seeing an increase and a sort of uh, a higher hunger level for young musicians to, to, to enter competition, your competition as a, as a way forward because some of their other opportunities are not as, uh, uh, they don't have as many other opportunities elsewhere? Um, well, um, uh, we had the application deadline uh, in October, but yeah. then uh, we decided, uh, and the, the, the upcoming competition would be in February 21, but then we decided at the beginning of October that we will postpone it to February 22. Uh, it was at the very early stage, but um, yeah, um, we took everything into con consideration and, and uh, even this chamber music idea that people have to practice together, be together at the same place uh, in, uh, in, in case for preparing for the competition. And we had a lot of um, talkings with teachers uh, all over the world and they said, oh no, it's not working at the moment. We can't teach, uh, we can't teach piano trios, we can't teach the, the, the chamber music ensembles. And um, because, um, yeah, universities uh, are not open or um, people are not at the same place. And then we decided to do this. But um, all those who already applied for our competition were very disappointed. And we saw this then. Also, we, um, we told everybody um, they will be accepted uh, next year because we only shift the completely designed um, competition only like it is. Uh, yes. Only one year. And and everybody can take uh, take can take um, uh, part in the next year as well. Uh, we we don't mind age limits. We keep it as we as we uh, told uh, before. And um, yeah, but the, the hunger is really uh, uh, big. And uh, and we we saw that we had to disappoint a lot of young musicians and that, uh, that hurt, yeah. But I think we, we yeah, we, we tried to, to take everything into consideration. And then at the end, it came to that, that we will postpone it one year. And we really hope that in February 22, we can do it uh, like we used to do it. And to have this idea of being together, bringing participants together, um, is uh, is possible then? Sorry, um, I think I I have to leave. I am just recovering from COVID at the moment. Oh, okay. um, yeah, I'm 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 yeah I'm not on my top. <laughs> um, yeah, well, um, it 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 hit me quite hard. I I didn't expect it. Um, yeah. 
um, I, yeah, I'm it started sorry. two weeks yeah. ago, and now slowly I I feel I feel better again. I'm sorry but, to hear, uh, and I think it shows, you know, uh, well, it, it musicians, audiences, administrators, managers, we're all susceptible, and we're, our worlds have all been turned upside down. Uh, I think it also highlights, as you said, the, 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 the real need for organizations such as, such as ours, such as Gmail, such as these forums to bring together uh, and try and coordinate as best as possible your changing dates and your changing um, predictions so that we can help musicians um, secure as many of these opportunities as still are possible without sort of stepping on each other as the competitions all postpone forward. Um, at the Global Foundation for the Performing Arts, we'd maintain a very strong international directory of competitions and festivals and academies. And I really encourage you to look at this and to take this into consideration when you're, you're planning the next one. But it will continue to be a very adaptable and adapting time uh, coming up. David Jackson from Cardiff, if, uh, uh, how are preparations uh, for the next edition? or are you on hold uh, for the moment? Um, I think, perhaps, thank you, first of all, for inviting me to this and uh, hello, everybody. Um, I think in a way we're perhaps fortunate in that our competition happens every two years. And so therefore we were not planning a competition this year and uh, our next competition will be in June 21. And so we're determined if it's at all possible to stick to those dates and to hold our competition. But of course, like all my colleagues, we're having to respond to a changing situation, certainly weekly, if not daily, in some cases. And here in the UK, uh, we're, you know, each different part of the UK has different regulations. It's very difficult to keep track of what we can and can't do. But we are absolutely determined to have a competition. And so uh, in light of that, we've got about nine or 10 different scenarios that, that we're planning, uh, which range from doing the competition in a studio setting with no audience whatsoever, just camera, cameras and microphones, uh, to a socially distanced audience, which is tricky because we also rely on box office to help us mount the event, although we're very lucky that we're funded by the BBC and other sources. But uh, we've constantly held the little hope in our hearts that by next June we may still be able to have the competition as we know it and love it but that as time goes by that feels less and less likely. Um, we have uh, now received all of our applications and we're going through our selection process. Luckily a few years ago we moved on to an online selection process so that's been part of what we do anyway. Um, the standard of applications this year and I'm sure it's because so many brilliant young singers have lost work and have got mm. staring at empty diaries uh, so we have had some fantastic singers and the quality is probably higher than it's ever been and the number is more so our poor selection panel is really struggling to uh, to get it down to the numbers but at the moment we're confident that the competition will certainly go ahead in quite what format it will be we will still be changing it i'm sure probably up until just weeks beforehand but uh, at the moment we're determined to keep going in in june 2021 Thank you. I wish you all the best. And I think you highlight an important fact, which is uh, and, uh, the need for you know, clear guidelines, clear uh, government communication, authority communication to help all of us in the cultural sector um, adjust to, to, to safe guidelines and uh, the latest information. Uh, please understand, I'm afraid that we, um, we have to move uh, forward to the next session. Uh, I would like to in, uh, encourage you, all of you are welcome to stay on throughout this entire uh, panel session uh, this morning. Uh, the, the second half of this, dis this discussion will be uh, devoted to the annual meeting of the Global Music Education League, which are the, the conservatoires that you, that you see as participants here. Uh, before we move, I, I wish to thank all the competition directors who are here today, and I really understand what you're going through. Uh, having been a competition director myself, I wish you all the best. I wish you to maintain flexibility and uh, a good spirit. 
and uh, that we will hold more of these forums, uh, again, with government policymakers on board so that you can, your voices can be heard as, as, as um, accurately as possible by decision makers. Before I pass the floor to Professor Wang, uh, it's an honor to invite uh, Dr. Laszlo Nobot Nemes from the Liszt Academy of Music in Budapest to say uh, a, short, a few words about uh, your work at the Liszt Academy. You are the director of the Kadai Institute and chair of the Department of Music Pedagogy. And uh, I would like to pass the floor to yourself, Dr. Nemes, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for the honorable invitation to speak shortly at this prestigious uh, forum. Um, as it has been said, I'm representing the International Kodai Pedagogical Institute that operates under the Liszt Ferenc Academy of Music. Over the past uh, four decades, since its foundation in 1975, the Kodai Institute has become an international center for advanced studies in Kodai-based music education and music teacher training and has so far uh, had a profound influence of several generations of music educators that came to study to Hungary uh, at the Kodai Institute from all over the world. More than 4,000 students have part participated in our undergraduate, graduate, uh, postgraduate, part-time, full-time courses and summer courses. Um, I, when talking about uh, Kodai, I should say that um, he's one of the most prominent figures of not just Hungarian music, but Hungarian culture in general. His legacy is a huge and rich reservoir of uh, wisdom about the essence of art, music, uh, Hungary's European uh, and Hungarian identity, um, his beliefs about our Eastern tradition in the light of Western culture, his thoughts about national cultural heritage, and of course, music education. His uh, music pedagogic concept uh, in mm, 2016 was inscribed on the register of best safeguarding practices of intangible cultural heritage by UNESCO. Could I believe that the values of musical art can only be transmitted to the next generation by teachers who are highly capable musicians. We at the Koda Institute share his belief about the music educators that are not only enthusiastic, but also capable of nurturing the musical potential in the younger generations. We believe that music education begins with artistry and artistry music education depends on the quality of teaching and on the quality of music being taught. We are today surrounded by many forms of popular methodologies about musical instruction. What we stand for is uh, modern music education that continues like in the past uh, to preserve the value um, of uh, musical art. Like many of you here at this forum, we believe that we are sort of uh, missionaries working the cause of uh, music education. We work for the humanistic, uh, for the preservation of the humanistic values of uh, music that we all know has the power to touch the lives of all young people. The most imp important aspect of Kodai-based music education is singing. Singing is a wonderful and easily accessible tool in music education that helps young people to participate in communal music making in an easy way. Most importantly, choral singing activities. Um, music making, communal music making and singing in schools 
uh, have been devastated by the COVID-19 pandemic, singing what was formerly among the safest um, educational activities in um, a music lesson has become lethal due to the capacity of, the, of transmitting this deadly virus. Moreover, the need for physical distancing and restrictions on indoor gatherings have destroyed the close human proximity that is central to collective music making and collective music uh, performance. Cons consequently, students of school education have been denied the opportunity to sing in the singing classes. Thousands of music teachers have been struggling for <clears throat> the right approach of how to adjust to the challenges of these uh, months. At the Koda Institute, we also had to respond fast the online and the digital resources that we developed uh, over the past few years assisted us uh, and the teachers that we work with in their daily teaching activities. And the, these two developments uh, include uh, the Kodai Hub, which is an online um, knowledge center, as I would say, and the digital application for the development and learning of musical reading uh, and writing skills. Um, so th this is our way to cope with this situation and uh, I believe that this forum will uh, um, give participants uh, um, many new ideas and but most importantly possibly it will uh, this forum will make the attempt to give adequate answers to the challenges posed to us by these challenging uh, times. Hopefully, we will be able to see many uh, fine models that can be attracted, adapted in uh, various cultural and educational environments. The Kodayan way is one of these uh, models. Thank you again for the opportunity and I pass the word to the next panelist. Thank you. Uh, that concludes our, uh, our session uh, devoted to competitions. And now it's a pleasure to pass the floor once again to Professor Li Guang Wang, who is uh, chair of the Global Music Education League to continue the annual meeting of the league. Thank you very much, Professor Wang. 非常感谢严明先生对上一个单元的精准的主持和各位大家的精彩的发言那么接下来由全球教育联盟关于疫情下高等院学校全球合作的创新与发展这样一个议题就交由全球教育联盟的理事美国伊斯曼音乐学院院
So to all who helped bring us together uh, these two days, thank you so much. This morning, I'm, I'm very pleased to introduce four speakers who represent institutions from Russia, Norway, Thailand, and Italy. They're going to be speaking about the international activities and initiatives occurring in their home institutions and their philosophies about global collaboration. So I'm very pleased to welcome uh, the first presenter, Alexei Vasiliev, who is director of the St. Petersburg State Conservatory in Russia. Uh, Alexei. Hello, thank you very much. I'm here. I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, can I use uh, some presentation? I will try to do that if it's possible. Do you tell me if it's not work? Uh, yes, it is possible. I will try to do that now. Is it possible for you to see now? Uh, anything? Uh, yeah. Is there any demonstration or not? Just seeing, your, uh, seeing you right now. Just me. Yes. Well, okay. I'll I'll just do that. Then I'll just will speak. That will be better anyway in this uh, kind of format. Okay. So, dear friends, I I would love to speak a little bit. Thank you very much for that honorable invitation to take part in this uh, very important uh, conversation today, and. Uh, I, everyone knows that nowadays uh, we live in very special time, that, that uh, pandemic time, which is uh, uh, very special for us. We didn't have uh, enough of uh, skills how to survive, you know, but still we have to do something. And I uh, try to speak a little bit about uh, our St. Petersburg Conservatory uh, pandemic life. Uh, of course, unfortunately, at that time, we cannot uh, do a lot so-called life actions with our international partners, but we are still trying to continue our uh, uh, very good partnership with a lot of international schools. So, uh, we still online and uh, we, we did a lot of activities this uh, uh, 2020, 2020 year. And first, but as uh, I uh, first think I want to speak about is, uh, um, you know, uh, entering exam session because that was here in St. Petersburg, that was very unusual because the entrance exams were completely uh, online. So we used, um, uh, recordings, video recordings of our uh, entrance candidates and the jury was online too. And uh, there was very interesting effect about that because this year uh, we had a lot, a lot of applications, uh, uh, much more than usual. I think uh, this internet online format gives us this possibility uh, to hear much more uh, applicants than usually. I think uh, that because uh, they had possibility to send the recording anyway. Uh, so geography would not be a, a factor that could uh, make them have some decisions um, and we uh, as a result we've got very good students uh, some of them maybe would not come if there was not online format this year uh, and we have got also uh, a lot a lot of international students too uh, truly speaking in our conservatory the most part of international students are Chinese students, uh, but Chinese students are very, very uh, active now. And uh, from the 1st of September, you know, here in uh, Russian Federation and in St. Petersburg, the uh, year 
for students starts September 1st. From the September 1st, all of them are online with us, but they are, as I know, uh, they are very interesting, even in that kind of uh, collaboration with the professors. And uh, this is, um, of course, a new experience for everyone, new experience for us, and at the same time, new experience for them. But we are testing that, and I would say the tests are rather good than bad. Um, and uh, I think it's good way to survive in that strange time. But of course, it would be better to get back to uh, traditional methods of music education. But uh, for nowadays, it's anyway, it's better to do it online than to do nothing for us. And as a uh, uh, one more action we did uh, last time to um, demonstrate this point of view was a traditional international festival of uh, music institutes. This festival uh, was, uh, it, it was already 20 times. So that was a kind of uh, anniversary. Uh, it started in 2001 uh, as an international forum for uh, the uh, friends, uh, colleagues who are working all around the world in different music institutions. It's called International Conservatories, Conservatories uh, Week. So the, that uh, tradition is that week, this week, all our abroad friends came to St. Petersburg and we are doing together a lot of concerts, a lot of some science conferences, some master classes, and a lot, a lot of activities. But this year, uh, um, there was a situation that, uh, truly speaking, this festival could be uh, canceled. But in the last uh, moment, we decided that it would not be good if it would be canceled because this is 20th, uh, 20th festival and uh, this is anniversary festival. And we decided to turn it uh, into a online uh, format. And that was very interesting experience because you know that the transportation problems now are all over, over the world and uh, uh, some guests are came of course but the, the, they were from russian schools uh, but all the international friends and colleagues took part as uh, online members they prepared especially for the festival uh, performances and if you come to our uh, website conservatory dot ru uh, you can find there uh, the the list of uh, digital concerts of all our friends uh, using a QR code you can uh, get everyone you want to, to hear and you can mm, compare the people uh, what they did for especially for this festival not to stop the activity to continue uh, to be together. And that for us, that was very, very important uh, uh, experience of uh, continuing collaboration in a very, very strange time, you know. So uh, that's my point. I think I will continue speaking uh, always that the most important thing in our uh, activity in education, especially in mus musical education and, and creative education, is the, uh, the willing to be creative, to continue work with music, uh, making music, and there is no uh, some bad things that could spoil it, that process. And I think uh, that 
at the end, this pandemic situation will finish somehow. somehow. And uh, uh, I believe that uh, continuing our activity in, I don't know, via internet, or maybe we will invite some different ways, but this continuing is the right way to go forward and to keep our uh, heritage. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think that's the most important I would say today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alexei, for your comments and thank you for the work you and your colleagues are doing to support your students. Um, as imperfect as the virtual, wor virtual world may be, <clears throat> clearly it makes a, a major difference in the lives of the students. So thank you for that. Um, I'm <coughs> Our next speaker will be uh, Peter Tornquist, who is the principal of the Norwegian Academy of Music. And Peter will be talking about educational principles as the foundation for international collaborations. Peter. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jamal. And um, good afternoon to everyone from uh, a cold Oslo, but not yet snowy. So we're not there yet. Uh, thank you also to, to um, my colleague, uh, President Wang, for organizing this conference. I will, try, I will try to share some slides with you and give you a um, brief introduction to this topic. So, hopefully you can see me now, see the presentation. So, uh, this is the Norwegian Academy of Music. Uh, which is located in Oslo. I will give you some very brief facts about the institution before moving on to the topic. Uh, the Academy was established in 1973 as the main national institution for music education. There are other great partner institutions in Norway, but we are the biggest one. Uh, our campus, which you're seeing just a little bit of here, is around 20,000 square meters uh, in central Oslo. It's very well equipped. We are fortunate in that sense. Um, it's a mid-sized institution, 800 students and around, around 450 staff, including researchers and administrations. And we have a very public profile with 400 plus concerts uh, yearly or events because that includes conferences as well. Uh, we have, I won't make a big uh, mention about this, but this is just to give you an impression what we have, uh, nine bachelor programs, 12 master programs, two doctoral programs, so we are awarding our own degrees. Um, Quite a strong emphasis on continuing studies, which are one year further education studies. And we have a pre-college program, which, which I unfortunately had to shut down yesterday because the second wave has hit us hard. So we are not allowed to teach 13 to 19 year olds. Uh, we cover the whole range of classical improvisation, uh, jazz, pop rock and also traditional music. And our main emphasis is in the area of performance, composition, pedagogy, technology and music therapy. So it's quite a research intensive academy alongside the traditional conservatoire roles. Um, we have developed a set of goals and principles that guide most of our activities. And I'd like to share some of these with you now because it's sort of relates to our international work. So setting student first means making sure the student perspective is always present when we plan. Listening to students, creating space in the curriculum for student initiatives, encouraging them to develop their own projects and so on. So this is a very important concept for us of setting students first, which means not setting curriculum first or setting the director first of the teachers, but always making sure the student's perspective is there. The second guideline or principle we have is facing the challenges of tomorrow. This means embracing the uncertainty of the music profession 
adapting the portfolio to, of, of study programs to new needs in the musical life and also making sustainable green choices in everything we do. And the current COVID situation has proven that we are able to keep up a lot of work without traveling so much. That is an interesting choice and I know students are already asking questions about how this reflects the international perspective of our, of our work. Uh, the third point is connecting art and science. That's a very important principle we have. It means a lot of things, but it means also bridging the gap between artistic research and artistic excellence. It means nurturing the same, how should I say, inquisitive, reflective and researching mindset that we expect in all other university students, but through the use of artistic methods. Creating a culture for collaboration means challenging the structures and hierarchies that exist in many of our institutions, in many conservatories, enabling a greater exchange between different departments, between different genres, between different traditions. So I could also say creating a culture for sharing, that would be another way we say this. And, and finally, the fifth principle we, we used to guide our activities is being in dialogue with the world, which means being open to new ideas, listening to new voices, creating partnerships and expanding our networks locally and globally, which is precisely what we are doing right now. Now, the reason I'm mentioning these principles is because we do apply them to pretty much everything we do, including our international work. This is just a, a, the front page of our international collaboration on the website and you can see that I'll, I'll give you some examples of what is here. We, I, I have to say that approximately 50% of our students are international. Uh, the majority of them are here on a long-term basis, which is one year exchange or even being here for an entire degree. But most of our international projects involves group of students in shorter exchanges, typically one week. So, for instance, the, 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 the second project you see here, the, the project in the project on, on music pedagogy in India, where we are helping to establish a bachelor program for music teachers, we will send a group of 10 to 15 students every year to Bangalore. And there they will teach the local students and at the same time learn Indian classical music from the students, so that the local students are teaching our students as a way of learning how to teach. So it's a, it's a real exchange of learning practices and of cultural practices. Um, the same principle applies to our project in South Africa. That, that's a group of jazz students traveling to Cape Town for an intensive workshop on improvisation, sharing their knowledge on improvisation from a European perspective but learning a lot about the use of African instruments and rhythms, so enriching the culture both ways. Uh, over to the next, next column, there is jazz in Los Angeles. Now, that's a collaboration we have with the Thornton School of Music in Los Angeles, where we bring a group of American students to Oslo to learn traditional Scandinavian music directly from our students, not primarily from our teachers, but they learning by simply playing together. And, and finally, I, I would like to mention the European Chamber Music Academy, or ECMA as we know it. Uh, this is now a, a very high-level joint program between eight or even nine international conservatories and involves exchanging groups and teachers of chamber music. But here also the emphasis is on groups and not individual exchanges. And we have found this to be very productive. In the case of ECMA, or the European Chamber Music Academy, it also involves a very active collaboration with concert promoters and classical festivals around the globe. So I was happy to hear a lot of the, the competitions being present here. This is to create opportunities for learning and showcasing student work in a professional setting. Uh, ECMA is also an interesting example of a long-term development 
having started very small in 2001, as you can see here, as basically a summer course for string quartets, and then gradually developing into an association, a strategic partnership, a network, and now a joint master program at the very highest level of excellence, even receiving funding from the Creative Europe system, which is because we have these festivals associated with us. So it has become a very interesting way of organizing things and happily, I'm happy to say that we have managed to sustain this work throughout the, the crisis, and this crisis has hit us hard in Europe, because we have such a strong foundation that has been working and developing over time. So this was also, this would finally be also the how I see Gmail developing in the years ahead. Thinking long term, building relationships, developing a culture of collaboration, taking care to incorporate the student perspective at every step of the road. These are the, 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 guiding, the guiding principles that we have found to be very effective in permeating all international work, but it, simply because they also work in permeating everything we do. And I'm uh, happy that many of our partner institutions are around the screen here. And um, uh, this is a joint effort. And I think Gmail is an interesting platform for developing this sort of 21st century thinking. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Fantastic work that you're doing. And um, I very much appreciate that your, your guiding principles, the last one of being in dialogue in the world, seems with the world, is perfect for both this session and, as you say, the future uh, goals and directions of Gmail. So thank you so much for that. Our next presenter is uh, Panya Rungruang, who is the Dean of the Faculty of Music at Bangkok Thonburi University. And uh, Panya will be talking about teaching international students in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. So Panya. Thank you very much, Dr. Jamal. And thank you very much for the President Wang and the host that make our dream to meet to each other become true for today or tonight or whatever. I feel very good, very, very warm in my mind after we are do not seeing each other for a long time. And today it's my honor to give you a short presentation about the teaching music in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, it's my honor to, to be here about uh, talking to you. And okay, Dr. Peter, next year, if you have chance, you can bring your student to Thailand. You are welcome and I will teach your student to play Thai music. And all of you are welcome. Thailand is safe right now, but I don't my government around you come not. <laughs> but anyhow, we are together in mind. We think to each other in mind. So even we are uh, stay far away from uh, the, the distance, but now we are together. Uh, talking about music in the world, probably we have just two types of music. One is the uh, classical, Western classical art music, and another one is not. And as an ethnomusicologist and also the music education, I study both and I play Chinese music, I play Thai music, I play violin, and I love Mahler, I love the rubber talk, and I love <laughs> uh, any uh, music around the world. That is what I'm talking about, music and culture. In terms of education, you know, because of the, the COVID-19, it's made a huge wildly change of human daily life, human behavior, academic and others, including education. 
In terms of education, the Faculty of Music, Bangkok Thonburi University, that I am a dean, they offer music study in three levels, the undergrads, the master's and doctorate degree. The undergrad student has two majors, music education and musicology, in which all students must take Thai or Western music performance courses, either instrumental or vocal music, along with other required courses. The graduate level offer two majors, music education and ethnomusicology. With this, concentrate on research much more than performance because we offer the uh, PhD in music, do not performance. But anyhow, for the undergrad, we concentrate on both of the performance, both of vocal music and instrumental music. Faculty of Music has professors and instructors with having experience school and well trained both intra country and internationally, including, for example, a voice teacher that the pupil of the Professor Songi at CCM. So she's so good. They allow uh, 300 international students. And all will of that is 95% are Chinese from several provinces. Some of those are university and college instructor. During the past four years, we produced around 30 doctors of philosophy in music education and ethnomusicology, whom now working in many colleges and universities in China. For my experiences, I found that the Chinese students are smart. They're smart, they're with diligence, and they have high responsibility for their duty. They always turn in the assignment on time. That is very well training from China, and I love that. And we're happy to teach them. Today, virus pandemic still, but education must go on. And the Faculty of Music at Hawkenbury University has solved this problem for students continuously learning. The present situation is many of Chinese students who return to their hometown China cannot come back to learn in Thailand. And some of Chinese students still remain in Thailand. International students with Thai students are earlier time cannot stay together in school. But right now, the COVID situation in Thailand uh, has changed. It is okay to be in the same classroom. So that the faculty of music offer the new method of teaching, learning online combined with learning on site at the same time. For learning on site, the Thai and international students are in the same classroom with the instructor. Why this learning on site become learning online by using the Zoom as like as we are using it right now. That is for international students to learn at home. The online teaching method is about to teach both of theoretical courses and practical courses. Of course, this time learning on internet cause some problem and also provides uh, some good part too. For example, my students are happy learning online together with, with us. They stay at home and some of them learning on the in the car or on the bus, even walking around the supermarket and find a, a very nice corner to learn. That is very nice of them. And sometimes I saw their kids together with father and mother in the same classroom with me. That is, it's feel like we are in, in the family. Online learning requires high quality of internet and some specific qualifications of instructor and student. Uh, for internet, okay, it must be stable. If you cannot have it changed and sometimes it's got some problem too but we are smart enough to change or, or fix it. 
the instructors require well prepared for teaching, such as uh, having a good lesson plan, having effective PPT, like uh, uh, Professor Peter did it. I like that. Interesting teaching style and be able to motivate the student for the concentration of learning. And some one thing, uh, sometimes we have communication problem because we are teaching in English, we working in English. And Chinese students, some of those are good and some of those is uh, not very good. But anyhow, as a music educator, we know how to uh, change or how to adapt our teaching style. I use the cooperative learning. When we discuss something with a student, particularly on the something that like a philosophy in music or philosophy in music education, uh, sometimes we have to use a very, very depth idea and some sort of understand. That is why they help each other. The student who keen on English after they discuss with me, they're speaking in Chinese to each other and then we can solve the problem. And sometimes uh, we have to perform music. For example, I'm teaching the history of Western music and history of Thai music in the same period at the same time. And I would like to have my student get the hand on or singing the Thai music or playing Thai song or the instrument, but they are not in, in our room. But in front of them, they have piano. Some students play DC, and some students play Urhu. Some of those play the uh, accordion or whatever. I gave them the notation and give them the tempo, and they play it, for example, and have them perform, play it, practice it, and uh, make a video clip and send it to us. And then we mix it together and send it back. So we can, can make an ensemble from uh, many, many house of ours. And something is funny because some, sometimes it doesn't match each other quite well. But you know how that is the way we are learning. Uh, the instructor has to have a, a specific thing. Mm -hmm. And number three for practical, practical course, it requires sometimes a certain skill of the cameraman in order to have students learn effectively. So be, when you play the piano, one of my colleagues, she's a, the pianist teacher, she's teaching piano online to the student. And some of my colleagues are teaching the vocal music singing online. So this is the thing we need the cameraman to have some kinds of a good skill to uh, cross up or to pan or uh, follow the camera with the good movements of the hand. That is uh, what I have uh, to concentrate on it. And also the student requires well concentrations in learning and high responsibility. I'm lucky our student is very good like that. And we, uh, it, it, uh, they are happy to. One thing that I would like to point out, teaching music is not teaching them to play music. Music is just the medium to get into the mind of the student. We are not teaching music, we are teaching people, teaching people so that the ultimate goals of my teaching, our teaching is to produce a student for knowing the reality and accessible to the truth of all. I always ask them, what is the real music? What is the truth in music? Can you understand the truth in music and that you are playing or you are listening? Do you understand that thing? And having the true knowledge, that means the correct teaching, the right teaching. Like uh, when some people teaching Kodai, we need to have that teacher being trained in Kodai style in Hungary. I have a good uh, teacher in Thailand who has been trained like that. Or someone want to teach Karloff, they have to be trained in good ways of Karloff method. And also if someone wants to teach Thai music, they need to be 
trained, well trained in the Thai teaching style. This is the thing. But having true knowledge, learn the true thing with the true method. True knowledge, true thing, and true method. Something need to uh, learn by specific method, and it must be true like that. And number three, we uh, need students to be in good people. What is good people? Yes, good doing, good speaking, and good thinking, as well as effectively perceive and appreciate it, the true beautifulness. What is the true beautifulness in music? Some people said, oh, you analyze it and you know it. No way. When analyzing music, you never get happiness. You are suffering. That is the way you analyze it in something like that mathematically. You have to analyze music with your mind. Listen music with your feeling and to get the beautifulness. That is the thing we, is very important. So that the motto of uh, Faculty of Music of Bangkok from the Buddha University is music shape of the people and the people shape of the nation. That is why we would like to build up our good nation by teaching good music to our good students to be a good citizen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rumgarong, and thank you for yes, that reminder please. that we are teaching people, not just the subject. Dr. Jamal, yes. yes. Thank you so much. Our next presenter is uh, Professor Massimiliano Baggio, who is the Vice Dean of the Milan Conservatory of Music. And uh, Professor Baggio will be talking about teaching online versus in person. So I'll turn it over to you. Yes, thank you very much and for having me and I want to thank everyone and especially for President Wang for organizing this beautiful event. Um, first of all, I want, to, I want to say that I greatly appreciate the talk of my predecessor of the previous colleague because it was really very deep and very, very, very with many insights. Um, I give a title to this, my little talk, which is uh, musica da camera e non da videocamera, which is an Italian uh, sentence. And I could, uh, I, I, I want to explain to you which, what, what the meaning is. In Italian, chamber music is, tra is translated as mus musica da camera, where camera stands from chamber. And the, the video camera is what in English is called camcorder. So this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, pun and but is the gist of the question and represents the situation in Italy right now. Because uh, I borrowed this expression from a student uh, who was demonstrating uh, um, in, in a march against the, the closure of our schools, which happened for the second time uh, 10 days ago. It means that we are fed up with uh, teaching online and especially having lessons of instrument online. Because I, I want to take a step back. Um, the pandemic broke out during the last February exam session. And we were obliged to close the school overnight, all of a sudden. And we had to thoroughly reorganize our educational system, switching from in-presence to online. And I must say that going online has re represented a shock for the vast majority of the faculty. You can imagine that maybe some of them barely knew what an online platform was. In a very short time, we had to set up the teaching online. And this has represented a great problem and has had many side effects also from the psychological point of view. Because you can imagine that we are used, we were used to teaching uh, side to side, side by side with, with the students. And all of a sudden we had to change our relationship uh, and we had to teach through a screen of a computer. And needless to say that the quality of the sound is not the same because unfortunately we, in Italy we have a, a quite good Wi-Fi connection, but it doesn't happen everywhere. 
I live in Milan. Milan is a good uh, line, good connection, but we have many students not only living abroad, but also living in very small villages here, living in the mountains, and they don't have a good connection over there. So we had many problems and many times we had to to ask them to send them to send the videos, for example, in order to be able to listen carefully and later listen better to this uh, music and to the quality of the sound. But we are really extremely proud of ourselves because we managed to activate 100% of the courses online. And our students didn't miss a single day, a single hour of lesson. So we had the opportunity and we were thanked by the students because they, they didn't miss any and they could take all the exams they were um, due to. By the first, as of the, the, the June the 3rd, we went back to work in presence slightly, like very, 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 very slowly, but we went back. And it was like uh, freedom because uh, you can imagine, uh, we, we went back to having concerts, for example. And of course, we all the limitation for, for, for um, the audience, but of course, it was a great result, a great achievement for us. But what happened? What happened that we, happened that we had the second wave of the, of, the, of the pandemic. And now we are again locked down. Luckily enough, we had the council of the university directors of all the universe, Italian universities that um, asked the ministry to give the opportunity to, uh, to teach laboratories in presence. And the minister, was, has been, the minister has been so clever that he equalized the one-to-one uh, -one lesson in conservatories as a form of a laboratory. So we can teach now one-to-one -one lessons in presence, and which is a fantastic achievement. Of course, we, we must say that um, what has been mainly penalized by this kind of situation has been, of course, the, the, the great network of international relations, because it's fantastic to see all of you here on the monitor on my screen, but of course, it's not, it's not the same as being together, having the opportunity to talk one-to-one, -one, have the opportunity to meet in presence, to, to shake our hands. And we are doing all we can to, to go back again as soon as possible to this situation. Um, uh, in Italy, um, this pandemic, this infection is uh, slowly but steadily going down. So numbers are getting better and better day by day. So we hope to be back again. And we really hope to have the opportunity next year or as soon as possible to, um, to meet you all in presence for the next Gmail uh, conference. Thank you very much for the attention. Thank you, Dean Baggio. And, um, but, you know, I, I find it so interesting that, again, as we have focused so intensely in each of our institutions on how to survive this uh, global pandemic and crisis. I find it very rewarding to be with colleagues and to know that we are all in this together and we are all seeking answers together. And so um, not only music binds us together, but how we survive this and how we prepare for music beyond the pandemic, I think is something um, that I'm, I'm very grateful to be a member of Gmail and that, that we have this forum. Um, before I turn it over to the next session, um, I want to invite um, President Wang Ru, who is president of the recently founded Zhejiang Conservatory of Music, to offer a greeting to uh, our Gmail partners. President Ru, are you there? President Wang? Thank you, Luo Xi Yuanzhang. 很高兴参加本次论坛，在这里看到了很多老朋友，还有新朋友。尽管新冠疫情对世界的影响还存在很大的不确定性，但面对困扰，全球音乐教育联盟的同事们积极应对，化危为机，探索疫情之下的。
，音乐教育国际合作与创新，令人感动。在此，首先向中国音乐学院王立光院长和各位同事表示致敬。今年浙江音乐学院是首次参加联会，因此我要先介绍一下学校的情况。浙江音乐学院位于中国杭州，现在有学生三百三千零四十二人，设有作曲与指挥系、音乐学系、钢琴系、声乐歌剧系、中国器乐系、管弦系。流行音乐系、舞蹈系、戏剧系、音乐工程系、音乐教育学院等十二个教学单位。学校还拥有一批教学实践场所，面向全球招收本科生和研究生，与世界几十个音乐学院形成了战略。合作关系。学校创办有杭州现代音乐节、国际室内乐节、国际钢琴艺术节、舞蹈节、歌剧节，以及国际作曲比赛、室内乐比赛等。每年举办各类演出有四百场以上、呃。中国有句古话叫“百闻不如一见”。啊，尽管时间非常晚了，非常紧张，我们请大家看一两分钟的一个短片。<咳>很抱歉啊，由于时间原因呢，我只能这个跳着放了一点。目前，世界上最早建立的音乐学院啊，已经有两百年的历史了。面对日新月异的新时代，与时俱进、守正创新，是中外音乐学院面临的共同的现实问题。中国音乐学院王立光院长在这方面做出了表率。他提出的“中国乐派”和“八加一”音乐人才培养方案，非常具有思想性和前瞻性。近年来
浙江音乐学院也在教学改革方面做了一些探索，一是建构多元的教学机制。学校在原来十二个教学系部的基础上，创设了乐队学院、中国音乐乐队学院、歌剧学院、室内乐学院、合唱学院五个学院啊，实行艺术总监负责制，采取完全学分制和弹性学制。推行音乐季模式，二是推进人才分类培养。学校以学生职业规划和长远发展为导向，根据每个学生的特点，在表演专业设立了表演型、教学型、合作艺术型三种类别的人才培养机制，并且对具有特殊才能的学生进行个性化培养。让每个学生都能够选择适合自己的专业方向。三是加强国际交流合作，学校与国内外音乐学院、行业院团以及专业机构开展了广泛的合作，并且开展学生方面的联合培养，开展线上线下课程。各位校长，各位同事。我们愿意构建更加开放的伙伴关系，构筑更加开放的共享平台。欢迎各位校长和音乐家们来浙江音乐学院访问、讲学、交流。我们愿意为因受到新冠疫情滞留在中国境内的联盟院校的留学生提供线下课程。帮助他们度过当前困难的时光。我相信，在我们共同的努力下，一定能为世界音乐教育发展、为人类文明进步做出新的贡献。谢谢大家。Thank you very much, President Wang Ru. And uh, thank you for sharing that video of your beautiful campus and facilities. Um, to all of you, um, I extend my best wishes that you stay well and healthy and uh, that we all keep our schools open and serving our students. And I'm very much looking forward to the time when we will all be together in person for the next Gmail conference. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to President Wong. Thank you very much. We Moderating this final session, and we we do have some very interesting speakers with us here. I can see all of you gathered gathered around the screen. Uh, the topic of this final session, and we are running a bit late, but I hopefully uh, hopefully we will manage to do this in time. Uh, the topic of this final session is higher music education aimed at training advanced talents to promote the globalization of music quality education. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to give the, the, the virtual floor to Benjamin, who is the president of the Global Foundation of Performing Arts. So Benjamin, please. I hope you're working on the unmuting. Yes. There you go. I think we can thank hear you now. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. In the interests of time, I will keep my uh, statements uh, brief. And for the fact that I have already been speaking earlier during our session, 
uh, again, we will catch up uh, here. I, I'm, I'm proud to be speaking as part of the Global Music Education League annual conference. My uh, firm belief, uh, and I will, my speech is really a response to some of the key threads that I've been listening to and absorbing during our two-day conference. My key focus is bringing uh, the multivarious parts of the music education uh, sector together to ensure as much as possible holistic training for the performers of tomorrow. And in many ways, uh, in, a, in, in parallel with technical education and formal education, um, the honing and crafting and strengthening of unique artistic vision uh, within each and every music student. Um, the world uh, is filled with music and must always be filled with music. And uh, my long career has been based in the world of international music competitions. And I have seen the uh, opportunities and the potential and the personal growth that these forum uh, can deliver to, to young musicians. Uh, and international uh, forums where students can come together, perform between each other, perform for each other, learn from one another, are in my view, uh, essential to building performers who will uh, be confident to uh, spread their music, share their music, and have, uh, have, um, have messages to say. Uh, I'm also very encouraged uh, by what I'm hearing from uh, the directors of these conservatoires, the commitment to putting students first and the needs of students first. As our um, knowledge of performing opportunities change and adapt, uh, so I believe must uh, responding to student needs adapt. Uh, I also believe that these dialogues between, as I said before, the sectors of the music industry, the formal music training, the professional development, the role that international marketing and media play in keeping alive in however we like it, but in how we connect audiences to musicians, to uh, presenters, building an active and vibrant international network of people who understand their significant and uh, specific roles brings a more active and uh, cognizant performing arts sector. I am encouraged enormously uh, by the range of voices, the range of uh, serious commitment that I'm hearing through this conference. And I'm very impressed with the work of the Global Music Education League currently. And I look forward to some of the many ideas that have come forward where platforms such as Gmail, GFPA, play a vital role in becoming a, a resource hub, a reference point, a linking point, independent of nations, independent of institutions, independent of um, um, cultural uh, activities and different cultures, and that the, the, our, these platforms become more and more vital to share best practice, to share resources, and to share international exchange, which brings so much to ensuring young musicians build their voices of performance and build their performance practice in relation to one another. Uh, I salute very much the work of Gmail uh, at the Global Foundation for the Performing Arts. We have already begun to maintain directories of festivals, academies, uh, competitions, opportunities for young musicians and young ballet dancers. And I encourage you at the, as directors of music institutions to, to, to forward information to us at GFPA so we can help um, streamline the process where young artists can find and maximize existing opportunities for their future, be they grants, be they competitions, be they residencies, be they um, uh, short courses, master classes, uh, asynchronous uh, um, uh, study options. 
I think we have to work together to ensure that the classical music sector is vibrant. I think we have to support one another and put music first. And I, have, I believe very strongly that we must maintain these forums where we speak directly to government policy makers, the leaders of influential institutions and the leaders of our governments to remind them of the value, not only of the, the, the stage performance that classical music brings, but the broader context of ensemble learning, of personal growth, of confidence, of international exchange. And long may we continue to be able to talk directly to, um, to governments to support our endeavor. I would like to close now. I, I would like to thank Professor Wang for working closely on this conference. And I look forward to learning more and uh, hearing more uh, as we continue beyond today's conference about activities with Gmail and, and bringing this network of, of supporters of this vibrant classical music industry together for a long time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Benjamin. It's very inspiring thoughts about bringing every, every aspect of the, uh, of the chain together. Uh, I think this is an important uh, reminder to all of us. Uh, I'd like to hand over to my colleague Julian Lloyd Weber, as former principal of the Royal Birmingham Conservatoire and now Professor Emeritus. So please, Julian. Thank you. It was fascinating to hear the different views expressed at Gmail yesterday about the post-COVID world of music education. Some questioned whether there are now too many music students for the number of jobs available, while others, having seen the effect that COVID-19 has had on the performing arts, questioned whether enough students would remain who want to study music. Just yesterday, one of our colleagues, Suzanne Rode Brayman, the president of Hanover University of Music, said that she thought that fewer young people would be applying to music colleges in the years ahead as a result of the pandemic. Yet she also said that there have not been any fall in registrations for 2021, but that she's expecting a fall in registrations in 2022. I do not share Suzanne's view. If music students had concerns about their future employment prospects, then surely this would be the year when they had second thoughts about enrolling in our music colleges. My father was a composer and music educationalist, and I've always remembered his advice to both myself and my brother Andrew, a composer of musicals. My father said to both of us, under no circumstances should you enter the music profession unless there's nothing else you can possibly do. <laughs> of course, our father was using reverse psychology as he knew that you cannot succeed in the music profession unless you love music enough to be prepared to ignore his own advice, which I'm happy to say we both did. Even before my student days, I was always hearing people saying that it's never been harder to make it in the music profession. And particularly, that it's never been harder to make it as a classical musician. I have to disagree with this pessimism, especially in our own time. 40 years ago, we had none of the amazing opportunities that digital technology affords young musicians today. I'm just an aside here. Uh, just imagine what this pandemic would have been like without the internet. So if you want to learn about or listen to phenomenal quantities of different music, then it's all there at the click of a mouse. Only a few years ago, such things would have been impossible or would have taken weeks or months to achieve. And musicians are nothing if not creative. One of Royal Birmingham Conservatoire's current violin students has been recording YouTube videos of herself practicing during lockdown and showing the reaction of her two cats. <laughs> These videos have been picking up millions of views. And now she's been signed by Sony to make a whole series of recordings. And we can be certain that the experience of making music online during the pandemic will result in ever more creative offerings by all of our students. In fact, I do believe that this generation of students 
which is coming through the hardest of times, can emerge as the best equipped to handle the challenges that the music profession will undoubtedly provide. Meanwhile, it can, and it must be argued, that the world now needs music more than ever before. Indeed, the power of music to provide solace and hope during times of crisis was beautifully articulated yesterday in the introduction to the conference by Kathleen Bogier of the United Nations. So I do remain optimistic about the future of our profession, the future which lies ahead for our music students and the place for our institutions during the years ahead. But returning to the point I made yesterday, it falls to all of us at the world's leading music colleges to make the strongest possible case for music education and the benefits that it can continue to bring. And Gmail has a massive part to play in helping to coordinate our joint response during these unprecedentedly cha challenging times. I'd again like to thank President Wong and all his team at China Conservatory for delivering this important conference at this incredibly difficult time. As well as the United Nations, UNESCO and UNITAR, all the youths, this conference has been a revelation, I think. Uh, we've all spoken very openly. We've all shared a huge amount of knowledge. It's really important to keep it going. Um, long live Gmail. Thank you and Sheshe. Thank you, Julian, for very inspiring words. And I can uh, uh, confirm your, your um, optimism that uh, enrollment is actually on an all time high. It seems to be so, at least in most European institutions. And um, uh, so there is, there is a lot of, uh, lot of hope. We just have to go through this second wave, striking a balance between safety and sanity. I'm happy to give the floor to my dear friend and colleague Xavier Bouvier from the Haute uh, École de Musique in Genève. So Xavier, please. Thank you very much, Peter. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. So many things have been said during the last sessions, things that do not need to be repeated. But some speeches hit my mind, and I would quote uh, Her Excellency Ambassador Bogwe evoking Bella Bartok vision of a brotherhood of peoples. Anna Reid, remembering us how music is central to human life, and President Wong calling to remind the diversity of musical cultures and the intricacy of their manifestations in the modern world. Today, since we are meeting at the United Nations in New York, virtually, I would like to briefly call to your mind and celebrate a significant moment in history, the birth of multilateralism in the field of culture of, and education 100 years ago. The place of birth of multilateralism was the League of Nations founded in 1920 in Geneva, my city. The League was aimed at many aspects of dialogue, intergovernmental dialogue. Its main goal was to prevent war, and it was not very successful in that respect. One of its organs is of particular interest, namely its Committee on Intellectual Cooperation. Established in 1922, the committee oversaw cooperation in the field of education and culture. As such, it was the precursor of UNESCO, founded 30 years later. The committee counted such celebrities as Albert Einstein. Just behind me, you can see Albert Einstein, yes. Uh, Marie Curie, Henri Bergson, and many others. The poet Paul Valéry was leading an art and letters section where Bella Bartok was initiating international cooperation in the field of recording, archiving, and disseminating music from every corner in the globe. The commission was aimed at cooperation on anything intellectual, forming what Paul Valéry called a society of spirit. At its uh, inception, and seen from today's per perspective, the committee was tainted with Eurocentric conceptions 
of what culture and what education were to be. Conceptions linked to a colonialist agenda where education and culture were something to be brought to or to be enforced in countries outside the West. Reaction to this Eurocentrism came from two specific countries who wanted to promote a more multilateral dialogical approach of culture and education. Those two countries were namely China and Japan, closely followed by India, all countries with a huge cultural history, one that could without doubt compare with the European civilization. In China, a branch of the committee was established under the name Chinese Society for International Culture Cooperation. Its members, such as Tsai Yuanpei, had a strong determination to promote Chinese culture, to facilitate the study of Chinese culture, and to serve as a coordination platform for the many young Chinese studying abroad. This institution was the first project of cultural diplomacy of modern China, organizing concerts and exhibitions. In bringing to her memory this almost forgotten history 100 years ago, my point is to emphasize that dialogues in the field of culture and education are not a new trend and that non-Western countries play a seminal role in their early development. Let us not forget how far-sighted were intellectual, artists, and musicians in the 1920 in building cultural multilateralism. Art is not unique. Every local expression of it has something to bring into an international dialogue. Every musical expression of humankind has the potential to convey what Paul Valéry called a familiar universality. Let us follow the tracks of those founders 100 years ago and raise musical talents able to enter into dialogue with other musical practices and to build a shared space where multiple musical cultures can enter into resonance. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Xavier. Really interesting words reminding us about, um, about concepts like dialogue in the, the multilateral world. And indeed, many of these words echoing what has been said today and uh, yesterday. Finally, uh, Brad, uh, you, you've been a patient man, but I can see you're still online with us. Uh, you're a director of the Mount Royal University Conservatory. Please, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Peter. I'm going to try to share my screen. Um, see how this goes. How's that looking? Is that working? Yep, it's good. Awesome. Okay. Um, uh, so thank you, for Professor Wong, for, for organizing uh, this important event and for continuing to to keep these conversations going. It's also wonderful to see so many familiar faces and to see some new faces as well. Uh, thank you for allowing me to present. It's always an honor and I'm very humbled to be here. Um, our membership is truly global with participation from across the planet. I am broadcasting to you today uh, from Canada, from the city of Calgary, in the province of Alberta. I, I realize that for some of you, I am all that stands between you and your dinner, or perhaps <laughs> between you and bed. So I will be, I will be uh, focused with my comments. Uh, with so many new members in the league, however, I wanted just to take a brief moment and introduce you to the Mount Royal University Conservatory. We've been a contributor to the Western Canadian arts community since 1910. At Mount Royal Conservatory, we deliver music education for all stages, for all stages of development. So from beginner to professional, uh, for all stages of life, 
we have children through to adults, and for all stages of aspiration. So whether students want to perform in their living room or the world's great concert halls. So through our programming, we also strive to work to playing our part in building community through the performing arts. So today, what I wanted to talk to you about is pathways, paths into post-secondary programs by way of professional pre-college programs. So at Mount Royal, we're very excited about the development of our newest initiative, a secondary school, a private high school with an emphasis on performing arts and internationalization. Uh, the significance of this program may be seen on several levels. Our Academy for Young Artists will provide high school students with access to an intensive performance-based course of study that is balanced with their core academic subjects. We'll also provide high school graduates with post-secondary pathways by establishing advanced credit arrangements with other institutions. We also will provide yet another component of community outreach, which is a key goal in my university's past, current, and developing strategic plans. And finally, we will continue to, I believe, enhance our institution's reputation. So why do we want to do this? I'll give you three reasons. Uh, the first reason is that we have a new provincial government. And this government has begun reducing funding across the higher education sector. They are encouraging public universities like mine to be more entrepreneurial. Therefore, revenue generation has become a crucial institutional priority. The entrepreneurial for-profit high school will provide Mount Royal with the potential for future financial success. The second reason is that the students and their parents have asked us for it. Many of our high school age students, so students who are aged 14 to 18, already spend most of their evenings and weekends in our studies, studios, rehearsal rooms, and concert halls. And the third reason is, we think it's just a really good idea. There are, in addition to our university, there are six other universities offering undergraduate music programs, all within a two hour drive of our campus. With the establishment of our high school program, those six other universities become our partners, offering our high school graduates a variety of post-secondary pathways to continue their professional music studies. That said, there are some barriers. The biggest barriers that we are facing are coming from within our university. For some, the idea of an entrepreneurial revenue generating private high school conflicts with the values of a publicly funded liberal arts university campus. We also have a new president and he is wonderful, but he is unsure of the conservatory. He doesn't see the vision yet. We also have a new provost, our new vice president academic, who while supportive is supporting our new president. As well, there are some faculty members across campus who are philosophically opposed to having a high school on campus. Mount Royal was a high school and then it became a college. And then 10 years ago, it became a university. And my idea of opening a performing arts high school has some people questioning that I am looking backwards. I am looking the wrong way. Finally, as I mentioned earlier, I believe the high school will enhance the reputation of our institution. However, not all university administration and faculty are as excited as I am. As one colleague said to me, no university wants to be known for its high school. Um, however, we do have some support our advisory committee members and our conservatory faculty are very excited and on board and the parents and students remain very hopeful. We've hired an outside consultant to help us create a business plan and to cover all the government paperwork. As well, we are gently pressing forward and hoping to have a decision by the end of this calendar year as we have a critical deadline of January 20th. Overall, we see this as an important way forward. The Mount Royal University Academy for Young Artists will promote two important streams for our collective future. First, it will create the next generation of musicians, performers, educators, administrators. 
As well, it will create the next generation of music advocates, students who choose a different professional path. Those students are our future patrons. They're our future audience members, donors, sponsors, advocates, board members, partners. So in closing, um, I have to say it's early morning here in Canada, in Calgary. I'm still optimistic. The day hasn't beaten me down yet, but I can tell you we are positioned for success. For over a century, our conservatory has and continues to cultivate well-rounded artists. And perhaps more importantly, we also develop well-rounded people, people who are curious and creative and compassionate. They learn to work independently. They develop time management skills and self-discipline. They learn to take direction and feedback. It builds their self-confidence through a feeling of accomplishment, and they develop a lifelong love for the performing arts, regardless of their career path, whether they plan to pursue a professional career or not. A word that we've heard repeated over our two days together is sustainability. As well, we've also talked about generating revenue. We've talked about supporting young artists in their development. And we've also talked about access, the need to access quality music education. Our future performing arts high school will provide each of these, but most importantly, it will cultivate good global citizens. I thank you all. Thank you very much, Brad. And, and this, um, this very uplifting proposal, which I really hope you succeed with, uh, concludes the session. And I'd like to thank uh, Benjamin and Julian and Xavier and you, Brad, once again, for these very interesting thoughts. And uh, indeed, I'd like to thank all the panelists who have uh, contributed during these two days for very interesting thoughts. Yes, the word COVID-19 has featured prominently, but the word music has been heard even more. Uh, so with this, I would like to give my thanks and give the floor back to President Wang to close the session and close the entire conference. So, President Wang.非常高兴，我们这两天我们大家的精彩发言和我们各自都发出的观点，所以呃到现在为止呢，我们已经完成了我们所有会议的议程。呃，在我呃致辞之前，我想隆重的邀请联合国训练研究所主任啊马可罗
And I wanted to take just a few minutes to highlight uh, two things. First, uh, Benjamin mentioned about the need to continue to work together with policymakers around the world. And the United Nations can offer that window and that opportunity. I am so pleased to see Marie Paul Ludil, the UNESCO director of New York, a dear friend. Uh, thanks for being with us today. Uh, yesterday, we have the permanent representative of Hungary, who is the president of the third committee, humanitarian uh, 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 social affairs of the United Nations, who delivered a very keynote uh, uh, remarks. So uh, this is very, very, very important. Uh, we, I would like to stress also the words of Anne Reid, Anne Robertson, and Professor Wan in three key issues. One is the importance of music from indigenous people and their interpretation of life, how they understood the relation of music, performance, arms, education, among other topics. We cannot forget the uh, autochthonous culture uh, uh, and we have to uh, review how important are for the people this link in the world of, of today. The second point from Ms. Robertson and was the interdependence of nations and the link of performing arts and development. How today we can have an inclusive global agenda that leads also to independence among us. All you come together from so many uh, areas of the world to talk about one topic, performing as art, music, classical music, uh, how we can uh, amplify this measure, how we can deliver better services, how we can improve the life of people dedicated to the performing arts and uh, classic music. And finally, uh, Professor Wan of uh, Gmail uh, touched a very critical issue was related to development and to the other part of the world, the developing world, how we can reach to them, how we can make performing art and music part of the, uh, this equation. Uh, he mentioned about the imbalance that exists today and a specific issue of intellectual property and how we can make uh, a more open a relation uh, through uh, training on capacity building on the performing arts for developing world. So I, I think uh, we can do better and we can reach out. Uh, my executive director says that uh, COVID-19 also brought the democratization of education uh, because we reach um, more people around the world. But uh, Marie Paul also mentioned how limited we are in certain areas. Uh, Professor uh, um, 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 Baggio uh, mentioned uh, the, the, even in Italy, there are certain areas in which internet is not so, so easy to get access in order to do that. Imagine, imagine all these nations below the equatorial line with a few exceptions, of course, like Australia, New Zealand, but all those nations in the South does not have this capacity that we have here now. And I appeal to you that in your programs, uh, please, uh, Mr. Peter Tenquist, uh, show an example with these exchanges of students, these missions that he goes to Bangalore in India. Uh, uh, we can do much more to, to, to make the performing art and classical music a tool for development. I, I also think that there is a need to close the gap of generations. Um, the new students are more inclined to information technology tools. They are very savvy. I have a son 20 and he is the one who teach me how to use the computer. So imagine in, in uh, instrumentation and performing music now and I saw a question about that very, very wisely answered about IT uh, in, uh, in, in producing music. So uh, the United Nations made agency, my small agency in the whole system is ready to collaborate, is ready to work with you and to support. Uh, we have an exclusive relation on, or, or, or 
previous relation with uh, the Global Performing Arts now with uh, Benjamin uh, Gmail. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Wan, for carrying on this uh, conference today. And thank you very much for sharing your, your expertise. I am not a musician, I only sing in the shower, but I can assure you, I learned a lot today about music. Thank you once again for, for, for helping us uh, to conclude this. Thank you. Yishiman, 过去两天的线上交流，大家都奉献出了自己卓越的智慧，分享了各自丰富的经验，也提出了宝贵的建议。这些都将为全球音乐教育联盟未来更好的建设和发展提供有力的支撑。这次全球音乐教育联盟二零
uh, excellent hosts at the United Nations Institute for Training and Research for hosting this digital conference over the last two days. Thank you for the perfect assistance and the leadership of Ambassador Suazo, head of office at UNITAR in New York. For myself, Benjamin Woodruff, I now pass the floor to Ambassador Suazo to officially close this conference. Thank you once again. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Benjamin. It has been a real honor to uh, be with you, with all our uh, distinguished uh, panelists. Uh, today, I guess we conclude a very successful uh, event. Um, these events couldn't be possible if it's not for the support of the Global uh, Foundation for Performing Arts. Uh, personally, you and Ms. Lucia Guao has been uh, spearheading actually the collaboration between UNITAR and the uh, Global uh, Foundation for Performing uh, Art. So uh, in, in today's uh, uh, time with the pandemic around us and many institutions uh, shutting down and the effect of this uh, pandemic on the uh, performing arts around the world is more than important that we join efforts together in order to deliver the best message and to uh, amplify the importance of music, classical music and the performing art. So once again, thanks uh, to you, Benjamin, for uh, supporting and be a partner of uh, UNITAR in this endeavor. And also thank you again uh, to our dear uh, Lucia for uh, uh, keeping contact with us uh, and, and uh, motivating us to work uh, together. Uh, I think we have a very successful event and uh, hopefully we will do uh, more in the future because I see the need of continuing, continuing to fight for the performance arts around the world. Thank you once again for UNITAR and I really appreciate the partnership among us. Bye now from New York.